Today, I'm gonna to be showing you guys how I recreated the track Dirty White Shucks by Nightly. I've gotten a lot of requests to do Nightly before, and I figured I might as well start with their newest song and then uh, start working my way backwards. Mainly, we're gonna go over the chorus and what I do to get this really chunky 80s guitar layer that's super clean and syncopated. Also gonna go over how they layer claps and some other electric guitar layering techniques that they use. But before we jump into that, let me introduce myself. Hi, my name is Seth. I work as an indie pop producer under the name Velvet Year. I do one of these videos every Friday to show people how to create their own tracks at home. Songs I've either written or produced have been featured on these Spotify curated playlists, and I did an entire album through Warner Music Group. So if this is the kind of content that you enjoy, go ahead and hit subscribe. Or if you watch this video and decide that we might work well together on a project, I have a link in the top of my description for artists who would like to work with me on a song. Now that that's all out of the way, let's get to the video. So something I'm going to start playing with on these videos is a color coding sort of sections based off of what I want to talk about. We'll see if it works. Let me know if you don't like it. But I would say the first part worth looking at is this guy, which is that sort of fast electric guitar chord progression that comes in the chorus. Right, so the first section we have here are the acoustics. For these guys, I just use my Slate ML2 pencil condenser mic with my Yamaha acoustic. If you really care about the model number, it's the FGX830C. It's like their $500 model. And the way that I wanted to sort of tackle this progression is by getting those clean cuts whenever the track stops playing. And what I mean by that is if I zoom in here, you can see that whenever there isn't a chord being played, it is dead silent. Normally when you're recording it, it will look something like this. And so literally what I did for every single guitar track in this song was I went through, deleted that dead space, and then used the key command to add a little crossfade. And then I just highlighted the whole section and hit command J to consolidate it. So it makes it this one larger clip. And I did that for all of these guys. And the reason I did that is because this rhythm of like offbeat chord progressions that are moving really fast, that is like the energy of the song and the chorus. And I just felt like it was worth it to sit down and get that sounding as tight as possible. In terms of actual mixing, I'm just using Shep's Omni Channel just to kind of generally shape these acoustics how I like them. Normally I like acoustics with an optical compressor. But yeah, essentially what I wanted to do was sort of build out this larger chord doing these stabs, but only have individual tracks play a small portion of it. Also, everything is double tracked. So there's one, two, it's like three, four different parts. So the first one here, is sort of a muty, plucky thing. And for these guys, I didn't actually want them to sound like an acoustic that was being played by a person. I really wanted to get that sort of lower chord layer to be really clean and really precise. So what I did was I actually just hit record and just chugged out and just chugged out each of the chords that I needed for this rhythm a couple of times and then just drug them over and put them into place. Like you can really hear it here on these layers where it's going between like a D and like a low E. Like it's artificially clean, but I think that it works because A, it's being covered by a lot of other layers that are not edited that way, but also it's more of like the base layer. So it was more important to me to have that sort of consistency in the lower register of the chord. The next two we have are these guys. So for these guys, I was using this chord shape. I just figured it might be helpful to just show it to you. But essentially, this is a voicing where it's based around the key of G. And so what you're doing is the root of your chord on this fifth string here, playing a third and octave up over here on the B string. And then you're like, and then you're just kind of letting that open G string ring out. And if you're playing a major chord in the key of G, you have one fret in between these two. But if you're playing a minor chord, you have no spaces between them. Hopefully that makes sense. So with this chord progression, it was a four, six, five. So in the key of G, that's so in the key of G, that's C, E minor, D. So it's I find that this is a really good voicing for adding an extension above a lower chord. So real quick, let me play the acoustics with and without those upper chords.
when it's just these guys, it feels very static and edited. But when you have these guys on top of them, it feels it feels like a wider chord, obviously. But the energy bumps up. It can kind of hide the over editing of this other track. And then I wanted to get the Ace flavor, so I just threw a Juno chorus on the bus out. But yeah, that's all of the acoustics. And then below those guys, we have the electrics. So these two guys here are actually playing the exact same thing that that higher acoustic was playing. I don't know, I experimented with some of this and it just kind of had a cool vibe and like textural feel when you have an acoustic and an electric playing the exact same thing, especially with this sort of like 80s tone and on an acoustic with chorus on it. The other electrics that we have here are actually just playing an even higher extension without any real chord information. So it's almost like a range above this and this, and both of those are a range above this. So you almost have these like stacking ranges of guitar layering on top of each other. So for these electrics, I'm using a Corey Wong Neural DSP plugin on this 80s pop chorus preset. I believe I turned the reverb off and then messed around with some of the amp settings a little bit. I wanted that sort of edge of breakup tone, which for those of you who are not guitar players, there's like a point where if you have your amp set up right, there's like this point where where if you're lightly picking, you get this really nice warm round tone. But if you dig in a little bit with your pick, it distorts a little bit more, almost like you've switched it to like a higher gain patch. And so I wanted to get that sound with this track because I felt like it complemented these acoustics better. And when you layer all of them on top of each other, I feel like that's the main chunk of this syncopated guitar pattern is just having all of these different layers that sound like it's just, oh, an electric or an acoustic, but it's actually like a bunch of different layers tracked separately, panned out, double tracked, and then layered on top of each other. And then just underneath that, I wanted to add a little bit of sort of low end warmth to these guys because the rest of the track is pretty bass heavy. So I wanted to make sure that they weren't getting lost. So I just added a Juno. So I added a Juno here, just playing the exact same rhythm. But altogether, this rhythm sounds like this. And I would say 90% of the energy from the song is coming from that. And then the same way that we have those sort of three layers of mid-range guitars layered on top of each other, with the bass, we're essentially going one layer lower than that. So we have like a four layer thing going on top. And I just track this with my P bass. Very simple setup. Because I wanted to get everything in tune with each other, I just used a bit of auto-tune on the bass track after I tracked it. When I play with a pick, I don't know, I just feel like I wanted that almost synth style, like texture of a pick sound, but I didn't want that sort of like pitch envelope that can happen when you play with a pick. Like it just brings it in a little bit. Going into an SVT3 from Plugin Alliance. Again, I wanted to keep these hits clean. So I actually threw a gate on it after the fact because I just didn't feel like editing at this point point. If I turn that gate off, like it doesn't sound super audible, but when you have this sort of noise floor in between hits multiplied by multiple tracks, it does become audible and it keeps it from sounding succinct. And after I did a majority of the tone shaping here on the SVT, I just messed around with what I wanted to bring out of this bass with CLA bass. So I wanted to have almost like a synthesizer style low end, which I got a little bit from the sub channel here. The clicky pick attack, I wasn't a fan of, so I ended up cutting it out. I always like pushing my bases a little bit with compression. The actual like sub sub low end, I didn't really care for that much because the kick was kind of taking that space. And then I find throwing growl on and chorus on and just slowly lifting them up a little bit can just make a bass tone like this come alive because the growl is going to be adding a little bit of distortion, which brings up more of this like 150 range. You got to be careful though, because it can also bring up this sort of like harsher picky range. And then chorus can be a way to sort of make a bass a little bit wider. Again, you want to be careful with it because if you boost it too much, you sort of lose that like low end clarity. But then I wanted to sort of enhance this bass with something without necessarily adding another audible layer. So I went into Glaze by Native Instruments, found a sound that I liked, and then I played and then I played what I played on the bass, but in MIDI form and then turned it an octave up. 
It's almost a, like a lower mid-range element, which I'm also getting because I'm like high passing it a lot. But I find that if I'm trying to sort of make a baseline stand out a bit more, most of the time I get success from that when I'm just adding it on a completely different layer. It's like an octave up because then I don't have to worry so much about reverb and chorus effects messing with the low end of the bass because I'm high passing it and making sure it's staying out of that range anyway. And then I can just sort of lightly blend it in underneath my main bass. So real quick, here's what they sound like together. Then when I turn it off, like again, the first time I play the track and you listen to it, you may not even realize that there is a synth doubling the bass, but when I take it out, it definitely becomes less present. So that's one of my favorite ways to sort of make a bass stand out a little bit more. We then have these electric guitar layers. So for these guys down here, I'm using one of my favorite presets from Guitar Rig 6. I've been using this one for years. The Andy in a Bottle preset with the quad delay and spring reverb turned off. This is a replica of sort of an Andy Summers style guitar tone, which for those of you who don't know is the guitar player for The Police. It's a very low gain setting, but it just kind of cuts through and mix really well. It's going on a little bit of a send with some Valhalla Vintage Verb, but if I turn that off, and again, with these guys, we're adding some auto-tune just because I felt like with this single note rhythm stuff, when you have a lot of different layers and they're only out by like a couple of cents, to my ears at least, it feels like you can hear it. So here's all the guitars without the auto-tune. And then here's with all of them on. It just kind of tightens it up a little bit, which is really important because uh, for these guitars, I used my Strat and I really like my Strat wound with eight gauge strings because you get sort of that like slappy feel. The problem is that if you like pick a tiny bit too hard, sometimes things can go a little bit out of tune, but it's nothing that can't be managed. And so with these guys, we're sort of doing the opposite of what we did with this layer up here. Instead of trying to get everything to sound like one giant piece, we're almost trying to differentiate these guys as much as possible. So we have this first one here. So it has this four bar phrase that has subtle variations depending on which part it's playing, which is a great way to make a guitar part feel a little bit more alive. Like just change a couple of notes in it every few bars. This bar here is the exact same one as this bar, only I slide down back to a note at the end of it. Then I repeat that first bar. And then I add in a little something different at the end. So now this like single bar guitar part now fills out four bars in a very dynamic way. And then underneath it, starting like one count after. And again, if you listen to just that one part, it doesn't really sound that impressive. Same with this guy here. And you can even see I'm doing different variations with them. So with this one, it's sort of a play on this. And then the next bar is the exact same thing with a couple of notes changed at the end. And then that thing is just repeated over and over again. This guy is basically the exact same two things all the way up until this last bar. So even like how they're like repeating themselves changes slightly bar to bar. And these two are starting on the same count, but this one is static, very light palm muted on one note. And this guy's sliding around all over the place, higher up in the register. And then these two are panned left and right. So all together. Like when you take the time to craft guitar parts like this, it can really add to the overall vibe of a track because it's very minimalist and it doesn't get in the way too much. The next thing we're gonna go over are the drums. So the kick and the snare are actually probably the least interesting part of this beat, so. Looks like for the kick drum, I'm using the modern hyper boogie kick from Leno. And then for the snare, I'm doing the 707 Supercharge. Both of these are from Splice. For this like 80s flavor of indie pop, I really recommend the Leno pack. What is really interesting is the claps on this guy. So here's all of the clap layers.
And this looks very random, and normally I'm not layering up this many samples together, but the key thing to listen for when you're layering samples together is what kind of emotion or texture are you trying to get out of it, and focus on that. So like when I was listening to Dirty White Chucks over and over again, I was thinking less of, oh, what kind of effects does it sound like this clap has on it? And I was more so just paying attention to the emotion that it was bringing. It had a little bit of a live feel, but also a little bit of like a clean, modern, sample feel. And so I went after that vibe rather than necessarily that exact sound. This is probably the thing that I spent the most time on. And embarrassingly, I don't even really think it sounds like something that you need to spend a lot of time on. But essentially, we have a couple of clap loops here that are panned left and right that I had to like chop up a little bit. So it has this very like mm, da da da, and I really liked the way that this loop sort of had these like louder clap pits followed by a softer clap pit, almost like a hi hat. But then I wanted it to stay with that rhythm, so I ended up just like copy and pasting like some clap pits here so that we could get that rhythm going. And then they're like panned left and right. And then basically the goal with all of these claps was to get something that sounded clean and modern, like not the big giant, like Imagine Dragons clap where it's just like, Whoa! but something that still kind of felt like a, like an organic clap. We then have this guy which is more of like a sample-y clap, but I felt like it added a lot of weight underneath the rest of them. After that we have this guy which is more of like a like a snappy clap almost. Like it literally almost has like the texture of like a snap to it. And then we just got a bunch of these drum racks here playing the same MIDI so that I could like audition claps faster. And as you can see, all of these claps are like blended in different levels and different levels of them are going to this Valhalla vintage verb, which is kind of set on like a, like an 80s gated drum style preset. So these were the ones that I wanted to sort of like be in the room, sort of a wider, higher tinny one sort of like a white noise one, more of an aggressive live one. And then this one that basically just kind of felt like a reverb tail. But when you put all of them together, and then underneath all of this, we have some hi-hats and some tambourine. Panned the tambourine a little bit to the right, just so like that t -t -t accent on the right side just pops out a little bit. And then for the B section, a little bit more production element to it. So we have an arcade instance here from Distant Voices doing a little bit of a vocal chop thing. And then up here, we have a pad with a new line that I hadn't really played with a lot called Future Perfect. Uh, this is one of their note kits called Fluorescent Sphere, which I really like the sound of. Just sort of this like ambient droning thing. But yeah, that is everything. So uh, let's listen to what the full track sounds like. So yeah, hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. If you have any other like indie pop style tracks that you would like me to take a look at, put them in the comments down below. I legitimately do look at them for suggestions. Nightly was actually one of those suggestions. So that's the reason why I'm doing this video now. But yeah, if you've watched this whole video, probably means you enjoy this on some level. So it's subscribe and the bell and all that stuff down below. Also YouTube thinks that you might like this video from me as well. But yeah, I will see you guys next week.